Hatred Pharma welcomes you to the ocean of practical knowledge about small animal practice. That is Hatred's YouTube channel. We are thankful to Dr. Vinod Kumar for sharing his practical tips with fellow veterinarians. Hello, my dear friends. Let us have a discussion on the media stand and diseases today. Like what we are dealing with the respiratory diseases on the first day we have discussed about the anatomical peculiarities of the chest cavity the physiological part of the chest cavity different organs of the chest cavity their positions the pleura the lungs the mediastinum the membranes the mediastinal organs heart and other blood vessels, esophagus, trachea, etc. Lungs, different parts of the lungs, different lobes of the lungs, different areas of the lungs, then the windpipes, the larynx, the trachea, the carina, the bronchus, bronchioles, everything, their distribution, etc. And the commonest diseases of the chest cavity. Then we discussed about various methods of clinical examination of the chest cavity, the respiratory system, then the lungs in particular. Then we discussed about the diseases of the trachea, bronchus, bronchioles, lungs. Then we discussed about the physical examination like auscultation, percussion, etc. Then we discussed about radiographic findings in chest diseases. And now, yesterday, we discussed about various lung diseases, pathological conditions of the lung, surgical conditions of the lung, such as the lung lobe torsion, and so many other chest cavity vital organ disorders in which treatment can be adopted, then the prognosis, etc. And now today, we are going to deal with the mediastinum, the mediastinal diseases, their diagnosis, different mediastinal diseases and their diagnosis, different methods of management, treatment in different angles, prognosis, etc. Then, our masterpiece, masterpiece subject like hematological evaluation, blood biochemistry evaluation of respiratory diseases and other chest diseases. Then, plural effusion, methods of extracting the effused fluid from the Plural cavity, that is thoracocentesis. The methodology, the simplest methodology of thoracocentesis, which is very commonly employed in the field. Plural diseases are very common in our field, but we seldom diagnose it. Somebody asked me, some client asked me that, oh, when I diagnosed, a case of lymphosarcoma, he said, oh, blood cancer in a dog. I cannot believe. Nowadays, blood cancers are also found in the dog. So the newspaper, the Malayalam Daily, they highlighted that blood cancer is found in dogs nowadays. See, it was a truth that I diagnosed one case of blood cancer, that is, it was lymphoblastic leukemia. I diagnosed it, that it and I gave the matter to the news dailies to publish. They published it in a different manner that nowadays uh, blood cancers are found in dogs in a more frequency. What it is? What they are telling? I called upon again them after publishing this. I called upon again them that I said that see this had been 
in the dog since when the dog emerged in the world if there is a bone marrow there will be blood cancer so it is it was there but fortunately now we had all the modern techniques knowledge and skills to diagnose these conditions and so a veterinarian is generally equipped himself to diagnose this condition and what you were telling were not right as you gave a notion to the public that nowadays the frequency of blood cancer in the dog is more no it is not right so as when our medical knowledge and experience were enhanced we were equipped to diagnose and manage these conditions the when we were studying in the veterinary college we were not knowing even the significance of the media stain and now after 25 years of service we can i can understand what the significance and importance of the media stain is and so now media stain diseases are also important sometimes the dog may be presented with the cough and regurgitation or vomiting we find it as gastritis we gave some antibiotic we gave some antibiotic and that is okay but what happened it was not gastritis it was a medicinal disease and fortunately it a recovered due to our therapy whatever it is so let us come to the media stain diseases so we know the media stain yesterday i mentioned about the media stain the media stain it is a space in between both the lungs so the lungs is covered by the pleura and then the pleura is being reflected at the region of thoracic inlet and then reflected outside as the parietal pleura which is adhering to the thoracic wall and then again it is reflected and it is the inner membrane is covering the lungs the inner membrane makes the visceral pleura in between there is a space we call it as the pleural space so if there is an inflammation of the pleura there will be production of fluid this fluid will be collected in between both the pleural membranes we call it as a pleural effusion and so the pleura in between both the lungs has a space where we saw that the pleura the pleural re reflection the space is there so we call it as incomplete media stain so space in between both the lungs is the media stain space which is covered by or lined by the pleura so the media stain space contains the major organ which is the heart and the major blood vessels like the aorta pulmonary artery then the cranial vena cava is coming there the caudal vena cava is coming there then the pulmonary veins are there so everything are there in the media stain then the trachea the esophagus the vagus nerve the phrenic nerve other lymph nodes lymphatic tracts lymph nodes all these things are there in the media stain so the, these are the media stain organs 
media's channel organs makes the media's channel with along with the space makes the media's channel if anything causes like inflammation or injury whatever it be it affects the whole region that is a media's channel space we call it as a media's channel disease so generally media channel disease is there and it has certain etiological factors the causes the causes mainly come under four categories number one is trauma where could be the trauma is coming from the trauma is coming from different areas like it, it is it may be penetrating from outside or it may be penetrating from inside inside means from the trachea or from the esophagus mostly from the esophagus so a trauma is coming a trauma is coming due produced being produced due to a concussion trauma is produced to, due to a rupture of the medial channel organ Trauma is occurring due to rupture of the media sternal pleura. So all these things can happen. Trauma is the main cause of the, the commonest cause of media sternal disease in dogs and cats. Then second cause is infection or inflammation. So when we do, when we were dealing with the trauma. I said trauma can be from outside or trauma can be from inside. Imagine a very sharp glass piece is being swallowed by the dog. We know that the esophagus of the dog is funnel shaped. It passes somehow very fast through the media channel esophagus. Sometimes, unfortunately, while passing, it may twist by itself and the sharp edge may tear the esophagus and while tearing it is again tearing it is entering the mediastinal space it may be injuring the mediastinal pleura so we say there is mediastinitis caused by trauma <clears throat> and during this phase sometimes the results of perforation and through the perforation put particles can enter the media channel space it can irritate the area of course we know food particles may be containing certain bacteria those bacteria may, may be infesting the sterile space such as the media channel space media channel space is always sterile and so it sets up an infection or inflammation and so there also we called it a call it as media stenitis sometimes a neoplasia neoplasm may be a cause like the commonest neoplasms especially the commonest neoplasm lymphosarcoma regarding my experience i was conducting ultrasound scan in a deep chested doberman about six years ago i started ultrasound a scan during 2016 even before that sorry not 2016 it was 2006 sorry <clears throat> even before that i went to the veterinary college to study ultrasound during that time ultrasound was emerging the college purchased a new machine during 2002 and my classmate was in charge of the ultrasound now my classmate is she is no more now she taught me the first abcd of ultrasound during 2002 so after that certain uh, other classes were attended by me and 
I studied this thing and this when I was conducting this I hope it was some five years before I was scanning through the abdominal cavity the dog is having vomiting and I could not find much uh, lesions or much I could not have much findings from the abdominal cavity and I positioned simply I positioned the prob anteriorly towards the mediastinum. Inside the mediastinum, I saw lot of large, big, globular things. Those were the mediastinal, enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes. Immediately, surprisingly, I saw this. Within no time, I took the FNA of one large mediastinal lymph node. And it was very easy for me to diagnose that it was lymphosarcoma. See, the, um, I had been conducting FNAC in animals. I started FNAC in animals and I hope I was the first veterinary doctor in Kerala state to conduct FNAC in animals during 2002. I was really fascinated by a human cytopathologist, Professor Dr. Valaraman Nair, sir. He was the retired principal and the retired pathology HOD of Trivandrum Medical College. I happened to listen to a class on FNSE which was conducted by him. I was fascinated by this technique. Then I started conducting FNSE and together with this great man, I could see a lot of things. He really taught me as FNSE. Then it was my time to conduct FNSE and smear it, present it to him. He will stain it in Papinicolo and then teach me what are the things. This continued for years. So I conducted FNAC in this Doberman and I found that it was lymphosarcoma. So mediastinal lymphosarcoma can happen in dogs. And when it, there is mediastinal lymphosarcoma, what happens, these lymph nodes will become enlarged and these lymph nodes will press, compress mostly the flimsy esophagus and so food bolus cannot be ingested passed through the esophagus it will be regurgitated this regurgitation will be presented and the owner will say that it is vomiting so that is the peculiarity of neoplasia of the mediastinum. Then foreign body is the mediastinum. Foreign body cannot go directly into the mediastinum. First of all, either it can get through penetration through the sternum or the parasternal areas and enter the mediastinum or this body can enter through after swallowing and then tearing and going into the mediastinal space. So foreign bodies also can be a cause of mediastinal diseases. So these are the generally four causes. Trauma is the most common one. Infection or inflammation, neoplasia and the foreign body. Okay. There are certain clinical signs of a mediastinal disease. As yesterday we discussed, respiratory signs are having certain clear signs, like there will be nasal discharges. Yesterday we discussed about nasal discharges. It could be catarrhal, it could be purulent, mucopurulent, or sanguinous. So, 
when coming to the clinical science the respiratory signs are the first signs are nasal discharges second is respiratory distress maybe an inspiratory dyspnea or an expiratory dyspnea hatred pharma launches hatlav 250 syrup and hatlav 500 tablets amoxicillin and clovenic acid in the ratio 4 is to 1 which is required for our pets hatlav potentiated amino penicillin systemic drug amoxicillin plus potassium clovenic bactericidal amino penicillin with beta lactamase inhibitor with extended spectrum of antibacterial activity amoxicillin and potassium clovenate oral suspension hatlav 250 suspension amoxicillin 200 mg plus potassium clovenate 50 mg per 5 ml indications broad spectrum antibiotic for bacterial infections skin soft tissue and uti infections dosage for dogs 13.75 mg per kg every 12 hours for cats 62.5 mg per cat every 12 hours root oral presentation 30 ml amoxicillin and potassium clovenate tablets hatlav 500 tablets amoxicillin 400 mg plus potassium clovenate 100 mg indications broad spectrum antibiotic for bacterial infections skin soft tissue and uti infections dosage for dogs 13.75 mg per kg every 12 hours for cats 62.5 mg per cat every 12 hours root oral presentation 1 into 10 tablets you can book your order online at www.hatred.com looking forward to a long lasting business association thank you so as we said when there is compression of the trachea due to a foreign body inside or a tumor inside imagine that there is a tumor or a foreign body inside which is compressing the trachea what will happen there will be respiratory distress and cough mostly it is a upper respiratory tract and so what will happen there will be inspiratory dyspnea as yesterday i told in upper respiratory tract obstructions there will be inspiratory dyspnea and in lower respiratory obstructions there will be expiratory dyspnea so in this condition when the trachea is compressed inside the mediastinum there will be in inspiratory dyspnea and also since there is compression over the trachea there will be irritation of the tracheal mucosa producing cough so these are the main clinical signs which are seen clinical features of mediastinum disease usually associated with pressure on the structures within the cranial or caudal mediastinum anatomically the mediastinum can be classified or positioned or marked into the cranial mediastinum and the caudal mediastinum the cranial mediastinum and the caudal mediastinum the caudal mediastinum little bit it is more wide because it is accommodating the heart so that is a caudal mediastinum respiratory signs will be there like cough respiratory discharges etc it is said in some textbooks that laryngeal paralysis may result this is due to compression of certain sympathetic fibers of the vagus nerve where 
there is a nerve which is passing from the vagus towards the anterior side which is known as the recurrent laryngeal nerve so when there is compression of that area below that recurrent laryngeal nerve this compression will be affected to the recurrent laryngeal nerve also producing laryngeal nerve paralysis and laryngeal paralysis there will be different vocalization the pitch of the bark changes the voice changes so that is a clear cut sign of a mediastinal disease so whenever the pitch changes pitch of the bark changes in a dog you cannot say that it is truly a mediastinal disease it could be myasthenia gravis it could be hypothyroidism so that we have to find it out myasthenia gravis is very easy to suspect then so laryngeal paralysis can be a feature of mediastinal disease esophagus and other gastrointestinal signs also may be there like when the esophagus is compressed at the middle with this ball shaped big large mediastinal lymph node from both the sides it will compress the esophagus so that no food can enter the stomach it will be regurgitated so regurgitation is a sign of mediastinal disease so also dysphagia if it is if the compression or the irritation is at the anterior esophageal sites there will be dysphagia then honors syndrome when there is compression of the vagus nerve we all know that vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve we know the cranial nerves like what we have studied in the college is the short form o cube t square a f a g v s h you know it oculomotor ophthalmic olfactory oculomotor ophthalmic trigeminal trochlea abducens facial auditory uh, glossopharyngeal vagus spinal accessory and hypoglossal so these are the 11 uh, these, these are the uh, 12 cranial nerves and so the 10th cranial nerve is the vagus which is the longest cranial nerve it is uh, starting from the brain going through the neck through the carotid sheath entering the thorax through the thoracic inlet going through the mediastinum penetrating the diaphragm into the abdominal cavity so it is a very long nerve and so it is a mixed nerve it's a mixed nerve and so sympathetic fibers will be irritated and this sympathetic due to the irritation or due to the stimulation of the sympathetic fibers can cause a condition known as horner syndrome horner syndrome actually it is central in nature and when there is compression or irritation of the sympathetic fibers of the vagus nerve horner syndrome can occur so it is uh, the evidences are there horner syndrome it is a neurological sign where the sympathetic trunk is affected of the eyeball and the facial muscles so remember the merck veterinary manual they say horner syndrome h o r n e r s horner syndrome my third sunken toe my m y third t h i r d sunken s u n k e n toe t o e my third sunken toe is given as a card it is written in the merck veterinary manual it is written as a card 
regarding the symptoms of Honor syndrome. My meiosis, there will be constriction of the pupil. Third, third eyelid, prolapse of the third eyelid. Meiosis, prolapse of the third eyelid. Sangat, there will be sangat eye or anophthalmia. Ta, T O E. So it is regarding tosis. P T O S I S. Tosis. Tosis means, you know, it is partial or complete closure of the upper eyelid due to paralysis of the facial nerve, facial fibers. So, my third sankanta, that means meiosis, prolapse of the third eyelid, sankan, eyeball or enophthalmos, amptosis. These are the four signs of Horner syndrome. So, when there is regurgitation with Horner syndrome, it could be a mediastinal disease. That was, I was meaning. Then, Camel syndrome, Vinakawa syndrome. It is generally seen as cranial Vinakawa syndrome or caudal Vinakawa syndrome. Generally, we study the Cavell syndrome. Cavell syndrome is nothing. See, the vena cava is passing through the mediastinum. Actually, the anterior vena cava, it is coming from the uh, jugular vein, from the anterior parts, receiving the other veins and then entering the uh, right atrium as the anterior vena cava. So while before entry into the anterior vena cava, it is passing in between the medial channel lymph nodes. As when the lymph nodes are enlarged, that also can press the anterior vena cava. So that there will be stagnation or sequestration of blood inside the anterior vena cava and so the anterior veins also. When there is venous stasis, definitely when there is venous stasis, what happens? It is venous congestion. So plasma will excavate, producing edema, especially head edema, neck edema, and the forelimb edema. That is the typicality of anterior Vinakawa syndrome or Cavell syndrome. This is generally seen in animals or dogs with dirofilary hematis. Sometimes, but fortunately, dirofilary hematis is, is not seen in India, our place, and dirofilary hematis, adult nematodes, those are very large, slender, long worms, large, visible with the naked eye. They will be seen in thick packs very worm, big worm lord inside the right atrium so that blood cannot enter the right atrium there is sequestration of blood in the anterior vena cava and also the posterior vena cava when it is migrating into the anterior vena cava it completely blocks the anterior vena cava, drainage. It is a very dangerous condition and shows this Cavell syndrome. So when there is any blockade in the posterior vena cava, see in pregnant women, in pregnant women, human ladies, this is very common. The posterior vena cava syndrome, the Cavell, posterior Cavell syndrome, because when the pregnant ladies they lie on their back. The large fetus inside, they will slowly descend and they will take their position on the inferior vena cava. In humans, it is an inferior vena cava. They will take their position resting on the inferior vena cava. They will be pressing the inferior vena cava. So that the venous return from the legs 
will be blocked. What will happen to that lady? There will be edema of both the hind limbs. I not hind limb, the legs. Edema of both the legs. This happens only when the lady is laying on the bed. That is in the supine position. Okay. This is, this is very common in ladies. This is known as pregnancy induced caval syndrome in ladies, in humans. So that is a caval syndrome. Just to know what the caval syndrome is. So that is a caval syndrome. Then, sometimes there will be right sided heart failure in dogs. Such as, for example, when there is a diaphragmatic hernia. When there is a diaphragmatic hernia due to the mediastinitis or to excess, due to excessive pressure inside the mediastinum, it penetrates, the apex of the heart penetrates and the pericardium penetrates into the abdominal cavity. And so there will be a right sided cardiac failure. And so ultimately there will be a cardiac dysrhythmia, arrhythmia also. So all those things can happen. So how can you diagnose mediastinal disease? For any diagnosis, you need a thorough clinical examination. Some of my friends, they sent picture and asked me, what the disease is. Clients, they are sending pictures and asking me what the disease is. I say, how can I tell? I am not a magician. If I were a magician, I would have definitely told. I am not a magician. Moreover, I am running a private hospital. And moreover, According to my professional etiquette, I should not answer to such a rubbish question. So I asked them very politely, please bring it to my hospital. So, a thorough clinical examination is always needed for a suspicion or a diagnosis. What all things can be done? For diagnosis or clinical examination of the respiratory system or the mediastinum, we can go on with the auscultation and percussion. Yesterday, I mentioned about the tup, 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 doom, 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 all these resonant signs, dulls, sounds, etc. So, auscultation and percussion. While auscultation, you can get the different sounds which are observed during inspiration and expiration. We will get a clue while you are auscultating and percussing the patient. Then, if there is a pleurisy, of course, in the media stand, we can see there is a heart and lying there, there is a pleura. The pleura is there. So the pleura will be sometimes rubbing with the pericardium. Yesterday I mentioned about it. Pleura pericardium rubs as if you take a balloon, a broken balloon, you take it, introduce a finger through it so that you can get a segment, then aspirate it so that you will get a bubble, then close it, you will get a bubble. Balloon, gas filled bubble, air filled bubble. You wet your other hand and rub it on the wet hand. You will get a click, click, click sound. You will get a click, click, click sound. So this sound just imitates the pleuropericardial rubbing sounds. So that is a plural rub. We should say it's a plural rub. If you hear such a plural rub, you say there is a pleurisy or a pleuritis. 
then so fluoride is can be measured or diagnosed only by auscultation of the pleural drug then radiography radiography is the best measure by which we can diagnose a mediastinal disease yesterday i mentioned about the radiographs of a plural uh, mediastinal disease generally in a plural in a normal mediastinum there will not be any air air makes a good contrast in radiography that is why we are producing pneumo abdomen then we are conducting pneumocystography etc we are infusing air into the urinary bladder and then taking the x-ray so that the air inside the bladder can well form a black shadow giving nice clear shadows of other organs maybe we are concentrating the prostate or some stones inside the bladder itself so in radiography when there is somehow there air enters the mediastinum there is that case is known as pneumomediastinum in pneumomediastinum the air becomes a contrast and the mediastinal structures can be clearly seen normally we cannot see those mediastinal structures these mediastinal structures can be seen when air enters then we can use ultrasonography see i mentioned about the large globular mediastinal lymph nodes which i saw accidentally during the ultrasound examination ct scan of course we do not have it just don't think of it then of course we can do diagnosis by aspiration of the fluids suppose there is pleural effusion hatford pharma presents raj dogs injection suspension and tablets the safe option of antibiotic to beat resistant infections raj dogs injection doxycycline hydrochloride 100 mg vial root iv presentation 100 mg vial raj dogs oral suspension doxycycline monohydrate 50 mg per 5 ml root oral presentation 60 ml raj dogs lb 100 tablets doxycycline hyclate 100 mg plus lactobacillus 60 million spores raj dogs lb 200 tablets doxycycline hyclate 200 mg plus lactobacillus 60 million spores raj dogs lb 300 tablets doxycycline hyclate 300 mg plus lactobacillus 60 million spores indications leptospirosis early chiosis anaplasmosis lyme and bacterial infections dosage for dogs 5 to 10 mg per kg twice a day for cats 10 mg per kg once a day root oral presentation 1 into 10 tablets you can book your order online at www.hatwit.com looking forward to a long lasting business association thank you see mid severe mediastinal infections etc there will be pleural effusions we can aspirate the pleural pleural fluid and we can find what type of cell it is so that to a certain extent we can diagnose then these are the general treatment of a pleural disease like in pleural diseases 
Treatment is always symptomatic. We all know how to treat it. Antibiotics, NSAIDs, diuretics, etc. Yesterday I mentioned about diuretics very well. When it is a lung disease, better not to give any fluid. Because in acute and chronic lung diseases, especially in acute lung diseases, especially if the dog is having severe pain of the chest, like a contusion, a road accident, the dog may, may not be eating or drinking anything. Okay? And it is lung contusion. And if you give any fluid, means it will extra passage into the pulmonary parenchyma and will kill the dog. So you are not able to give any IV fluids also. In such a condition, if you are going to give the diuretic, what will happen? Only fluid loss will be there. No fluid intake, only fluid loss. You are inducing diuresis. And fluid loss will be there. And so that is why I said in lung diseases, if the animal is anorectic, better don't give any diuretics. So antibiotics are essential. Yesterday I mentioned about the antibiotics. The best choice of antibiotic is nothing. And the cheapest is the broad spectrum penicillin. That is amoxicillin potentiated either with cloxacillin or clavulanic acid. So also megaspectrum antibiotics such as ciprofloxacin, then endrofloxacin, etc. can be given. The quinolones. Or drugs such as cephalosporins, alone is not sufficient to deal with it. Some companies say that Ceftiofor gives high concentration of the medicine in the pulmonary parenchyma. But my dear friends, I have never seen so. I have said Ceftiofor with me. But Ceftiofor is good for, excellent for urinary tract infections or urogenital infections like pyometra, etc. But it is not effective against uh, pulmonary infections. So, the choice of antibiotic number one should be amoxicillin, cloxacillin or amoxicillin, sulbactam or trisulbactam. Or orally you can go for moxiclin. I always recommend it from a personal experience not to give amoxicillin clavulanic acid intravenously because I have a lot of bitter experiences in giving intravenous moxclav. Better not to give it than NSAIDs. Of course, we can have NSAIDs to reduce the pain and inflammation of the media stain. You can go for, we have a lot of NSAIDs like diclofenac sodium, ketorolac, Ketoprofen, Carprofen, Meloxicam, Batamoxifen, so not Amoxifen, Meloxicam. Then uh, we have other oral medicines such as Indomethacin, Mephenamic Acid. Then very light NSAIDs such as Acetaminophen. Better don't use all these things. I have found that. The best and safest NSAID for the dog and cat is Meloxicam. 0.22 mg per kg. Better subcutaneously. That is excellent in dogs and cats and good, gives good, excellent, long standing effects. So NSAIDs can be given, then ketoprofen can be given, carprofen also can be given. Those are comparatively safe. And always give NSAID once in a day. 
accompanied with either panda prasol or ranitidine. Then, radiotherapy and chemotherapy depending on the diagnosis. We can use, if it is a lymphosarcoma, it is a lymphosarcoma, yes, almost all the lymphosarcomas are sensitive to doxorubicin therapy. I have dealt with so many cases of lymphosarcomas, then malignant lymphomas, etc. Where a treatment protocol was found out by first administering doxorubicin following by vincristine and then the next week uh, doxorubicin etc. So we can find out what the cause of mediastinal disease if it is like a malignancy like a lymphosarcoma we can go for chemotherapeutic management. Then coming to the prognosis of mediastinal diseases. It is, if it is an abscess, it has a very good prognosis because abscess definitely sometimes it may rupture or sometimes it may undergo lysis. So it is prognosis is good for an abscess. The foreign bodies, of course, somehow you may be able to operate it and pick it out. Cis, it is a good prognosis. Trauma, of course, it gives good prognosis. It will be okay in some time. And granulomas. So all these abscesses, foreign bodies, cis, trauma and granuloma has good prognosis. Thymoma, thymoma has a fair prognosis. In our field practice, we cannot diagnose thymoma. And thymus is an endocrine gland which is found normally in young animals. And in some animals, it will be found in the adult stage also. And the prognosis is poor or guarded in lymphosarcoma. Malignancies. We have to tell something about pneumomediastinum. Pneumomediastinum means air in the mediastinal space. Air in the mediastinal space. When air is entering the mediastinal space, we can see the mediastinal organs very well. See, if you take a radiograph like this, you can see the trachea very well, the esophagus very well, see the aorta very well, see the aorta here also, superimposing aorta you can see very well. So all these structures, the mediastinal structures can be seen very well due to the air contrast. So, we should think, out, think about the diagnosis or the identification of the outer edge. See, you can see the inner edge of the trachea and outer edge of the trachea. See this. You can see the inner edge as well as outer edge of the trachea. That can be seen only in pneumomediastinum. You will not miss it. So, if you see the trachea and esophagus like this in a dog with respiratory difficulty, you should immediately say that it is pneumomediastinum. And the commonest form of pneumomediastinum is said to be idiopathic pseudomediastinum. Idiopathic pseudomediastinum. I'm sorry. Pneumomediastinum. Idiopathic pneumomediastinum. Idiopathic means we cannot identify the cause. So, 
in this radiograph you can see the esophagus can be seen here and esophagus is well seen here and the trachea is seen here the outer layer of the trachea also can be seen here so this is a picture of pneumomediastinum and why pneumomediastinum occurs air escapes from the trachea bronchi lungs or esophagus as a consequence of see we can it is simple logic from where the air can come and accumulate inside the mediastinum the air can come out of rupture or a perforation on the trachea or bronchus or lungs or esophagus all these tubular organs or spongy organs contains air inside so they can leak out and accumulate inside the esophagus so trauma is the commonest cause of pneumomediastinum then neoplastic erosions if there is a neoplasm on the wall of esophagus due to the erosion it can produce a pore that is it can produce a perforation which can produce or which can through which can the air can pass through and accumulate inside the media stain so that is a neoplastic erosion then there are certain causes where we cannot find out the exact cause such as iatrogenic example investigations of thoracic structures or complications of surgery these are conditions where we cannot find out the cause of pneumomediastinum exactly or sometimes the air can enter the mediastinum through the thoracic inlet from the head and neck wounds or from the abdomen air can also track subcutaneously and between the forelimb muscles group from mediastinum unless underlying cause can be identified see this is the thoracic inlet and sometimes if there is a penetration here air can go inside and accumulate inside the mediastinum so in the mediastinal if there is a pneumomediastinum what should be the management always keep in mind that if you find a pneumomediastinum you simply leave it nothing will happen in three weeks time complete resolution can take place there is no need i know that some of our friends have aspirated the air from the mediastinum no need it will be resolved by itself give a rest for 3 weeks with all supportive therapies the prognosis is excellent there is complete resolution in 3 weeks then it has been found to negatively affect the outcome of dogs undergoing esophageal surgery yes in esophageal surgeries it is more likely to form more likely to form and so human mediastinum always can be produced as a result of esophageal surgery the surgery is considered only if breathing seriously impaired and lesion can be identified and accessed so this is the warning which is given to all of us while attempting to aspirate the pneumomediastinum better not to aspirate
it can be dangerous because all the stalwarts say there will be spontaneous recovery in three weeks time provided you are giving good treatment like antibiotics nsaids etc you give it and wait for three weeks better not to aspirate it if you are aspirating there is high risk of penetrating the mediastinal structures see the mediastinal structures means they are not simple things one is the largest artery in the body what is it aorta somehow if you penetrate the aorta what will happen blood will squirt out in large quantities in high pressure why are we puncturing the aorta so better don't try to aspirate the air from the medial channel sometimes you may be penetrating the pulmonary artery the cranial vena cava caudal vena cava everything are there in the medial channel why you are disturbing all these big big blood vessels better not to attempt it then if there is inflammation of the medial channel which is known as media stenitis media stenitis causes one is esophageal perforation media stenitis means inflammation of the structures of the media stenum esophageal perforation for example a foreign body which is penetrating the esophagus and then touching the or irritating the or injuring the media stenal pleura produces media stenal pleuritis we say as media stenitis iatrogenic during bouginage so what is bouginage bouginage is very commonly uh, attempted in human beings when there is stenotic esophagus or strictures of the esophagus rubber tubings with plastics are introduced into the, into the esophagus and then a balloon at the tip of it is blown so that where there is constriction we can keep the balloon and then blowing can be done so that that area will be dilated that is bouginage so media stenitis can happen due to bouginage during bouginage there can we are not doing it anyway but during bouginage there will be excess dilatation of the esophagus by injuring or compressing other structures of the media channel it could be ballooning or a neoplasia there will be tracheal damage sometimes bronchoscope when people are introducing a bronchoscope that itself can injure the trachea or the bronchus producing trauma and producing media stenitis thoracic trauma or migrating foreign body that we have mentioned already extension of the infection from the lungs when the lung is having infection the infection is extended into the parietal pleura and from the parietal pleura it will be passing on to the media stenum so a strong and a heavy media stenitis can happen complication of thoracic surgery definitely and following back to the emia in all these conditions media stenitis can occur signs of media stenitis like there will be pain and fever it is media stenitis it is inflammation itis itis is always inflammation signs are pain and fever in association with signs referable to media stenal disease other media stenal disease like regurgitation difficulty in respiration there will be inspiratory dyspnea etc and pain and fever all these are signs of a media stenal diseases in media stenal disease generally the dog may not be able to inspire too much inspiration will be less so normally in a dog there is a thorax or abdominal type of respiration but the, when but when there is a media stenal disease or a pleurisy it will happen that it will be painful during inspiration 
and so it stops or reduces the duration of inspiration then sometimes the media sternum narrows or widens the media sternum narrows that is media sternum narrowing can be caused due to scarring after the infection scar formation and media sternum widening occurs there is cranial media sternum and the caudal media sternum there is cranial media media sternum widening or caudal media sternum widening see the during in the cranial media sternum we have the thymus we have the anterior vena cava we have the um, uh, media sternal lymph nodes so thymus and the lymph node itself make a big volume of the cranial media sternum hadrid pharma launches its hadpod range hadpod cefpodoxim 100 mg 200 mg disposable tablets cefpodoxim 100 mg per 5 ml oral suspension the safe and effective choice for stubborn infections cefpodoxim proxital disposable tablets hadpod 100 dt and hadpod 200 dt tablets cefpodoxim oral suspension hadpod 100 ds cefpodoxim proxital 100 mg per 5 ml indications cefpodoxim is used in both dogs and cats to treat a variety of bacterial infections including skin infections wound infections bone infections pneumonia and bladder infection dosage for dogs 5 to 10 mg per kg once daily for 5 to 7 days for cats 5 mg per kg once every 12 hours or 10 mg per kg once daily root oral presentation 1 into 10 tablets for syrup 30 ml you can book your order online at www.hatwit.com looking forward to a long lasting business association thank you the causes of cranial media sternum widening it could be media sternitis associated with a foreign body which is penetrating from the esophagus it could be edema it could be hemorrhage it could be abscessation edema or hemorrhage by abscessation edema all these things can produce a widening of the cranial media sternum then granuloma lymphadenopathy enlargement of the lymph node can produce widening of the anterior media sternum neoplasia yes then fat fat is one of the main causes if there is lot of fat especially in obese dogs labrador saint bernard in all these animals there will be excess fat and this fat can be deposited in the media sternum where the anterior media sternum will see we will see as yes, widened So in any young animals mostly the media sternum becomes anteriorly widened because there is a, a thymus thymus gland is situated there its shape and the structure produces or gives an impression of the widened anterior media sternum then causes of cardiac caudal media sternal widening causes of caudal media sternal widening caudal area means it is nearing to the pericard uh, peritoneum sorry, sorry the diaphragm so a pericardio diaphragmatic hernia gastrointestinal contents such as hiatal hernia megaesophagus cardiac and respiratory conditions may give impression of changes in media sternum marked obesity which contains fat in the caudal esophagus caudal media sternum that also can cause caudal widening of esophagus or of the media sternum
increase the pressure or damage stru to structures within the cranial and caudal mediastinum produces variable symptoms. So, symptoms of mediastinal widening such as tachypnea, dyspnea, cough, respiratory noise, dysphagia, regurgitation, retching, Horner syndrome, edema, laryngeal paralysis and heart failure. <coughs> this is common with almost all the mediastinal diseases. And some specific, specifically some space occupying lesions which puts on pressure or damage to structures within the cranial or the caudal mediastinum. If it is a trachea producing the caudal mediastinum di diameter increasing, the trachea shows dyspnea cuff and respiratory noise. If it is the esophagus, it produces dysphagia, regurgitation and retching. If it is the irritation of sympathetic trunk, we have the Horner syndrome and the laryngeal paralysis. Sometimes we may be having tumor which we can diagnose only through radiographs. Sometimes the mediastinal area will be having a tumor, a specified tumor. This tumor can produce increased widening of the posterior mediastinum. This is a tumor. Now, that was regarding the mediastinal diseases. Now we will go to the hematological and blood biochemistry, blood biochemistry interpretations in chest diseases. So, I have conducted a big webinar on Hematology and blood biochemistry interpretation. So most of our friends may be recollecting or remembering that. According to that studies, I have mentioned that whenever there is a paracute disease, immediately there will be abrupt lowering of the total leukocytic count in paracute disease. And during the second stage, the immune system of the body will come to know that a noxious stimulus has entered the body and so what it does it increases the leukocyte count so from as per, at first there will be a neutro leukocytopenia followed by leukocytosis and at the same time the same thing happens in the respiratory disease also a leukocytopenia followed by severe leukocytosis and this leukocytosis mostly will be regenerative shift left only. There will be immature or band cell neutrophilia. So neutrophilia indicates the presence of inflammation or infection, which may be localized to the nose or may be associated with distant diseases like pneumonia. Maybe a localized infection or maybe extensive infection. And eosinophilia may occur with allergic or parasitic rhinitis. A lot of uh, parasitic infections are there. We have uh, the dyrophilaria and filarial worms. We have the adult worms even irritating the lung parenchyma and also the uh, pleura. And we have the lung worm. So all this can be seen. When the respiratory disease or the mediastinal disease is due to a worm, a nematode or the filaria, it definitely produces eosinophilia. And if there is epistaxis, the primary sign was epistaxis and in such conditions you may be able to detect thrombocytopenia. 
thrombocyte opinion. The most significant biochemical finding that relates specifically to nasal disease is hyperglobulinemia. Yes, the globulin content and the albumin content of the plasma. When there is an infection, there will be hyperglobulinemia. The same thing happens here also. Hyperglobulinemia that can happen, can be the finding in a respiratory disease. Then coagulation profiles. Sometimes in severe forms of rickettsial diseases like our commonly found ehrlichiosis or babesiosis, due to thrombocytopenia, there will be high lagging of coagulation time. So coagulation time is actually noted by the capillary method. The capillary tubes are inserted to the blood and then at times in different timings it is broken. And when it coagulates at first that means a string shaped clot is obtained we say that the blood is clotted. So that is a coagulation time or the clotting time. We know we are always looking for the clotting time in snake bites. Naturally, the clotting time should, clotting time should be less than 5 minutes. But here, we are actually looking the clotting time for 20 minutes. In a suspected snake bite, the 20 minutes clotting time test is the best one for the primary screening. That's a coagulation profile. The clotting time will be increased. After 20 minutes, we are taking the tube, blood collected tube, then tilting it. If it is still unclotted, it means it could be a snake bite. If it has clotted already means that is not a snake bite. It is something else we have to find it out. So, clotting, clotting time test is important. Bleeding time is usually measured over the buccal mucosa. I also used to look that the buccal mucosa is pricked and then we will find out up to how, what time it is bleeding continuously. The normal time for cessation of bleeding is quoted to be 2.6 minutes plus or minus 0.5 minutes in the dog and 1.9 plus or minus 0.5 minutes in the cat. Times less than 5 minutes may be considered as normal. Above 5 minutes means it is abnormal. Then sometimes the respiratory pathology shows epistaxis. In epistaxis, we need a complete blood cell count with a neutrophil count, leukocyte count and thrombocyte count. If there is epistaxis, thrombocyte count is essential. And if there is rhinitis, no specific hematological changes will be there. Parasites inside the nasal cavity even shows rhinitis. In such cases, lot of eosinophils will be there in the blood film and also from the nasal cataral discharges you can see the eggs of the worms if worms are there then uh, in that cataral discharge itself you can see lot of eosinophils then tumors tumors in the respiratory system it shows eosinophilia or lymphocytosis Allergic rhinitis show eosinophilia. Then in laryngitis and pharyngitis, bacterial and viral infections show leukocytosis and neutrophilia. See, there was a notion among all veterinarians 
no it is not there uh, there that in hematology and biochemistry if we are meeting with a viral disease there will be leukocytosis and if it is a bacterial disease it will be uh, neutrophilia so it was a notion of all our doctors that a viral disease produces lymphocytosis and a bacterial disease produces neutrophilia no it is not like that neutrophils and lymphocytes can hide up in any disease but chronic conditions only show this type of specific hikes. So bacterial and viral infections show leukocytosis and neutrophilia. Allergic and parasitic conditions show eosinophilia. In canal cuff, at first there will be a leukocytopenia and then immediately the leukocyte cells will shoot up producing leukocytosis and neutrophilia. In lung and mediastinal diseases, we can go for the hematological and blood biochemistry studies. In lung and mediastinal diseases, hematological findings such as neutrophilia, leukocytosis, so the neutrophilia, leukocytosis, eosinophilia, etc., can be seen in pulmonary diseases, pleural diseases, and mediastinal diseases. And coming to the blood biochemistry levels, ALT level increases in pneumonitis. Pneumonitis will not in pneumonia because in pneumonia there is no inflammation of the lung parenchyma. <clears throat> there is only inflammation of the pulmonary alveolar borders. So AST level increases in pneumonitis, lung trauma, lung fibrosis, metastatic lung diseases, lung carcinoma, and severe pulmonary consolidation. In all these conditions, a ST level increases. See, in our blood biochemistry class, we studied that AST, ALT is a liver specific enzyme, and AST is a non specific enzyme. AST is found almost everywhere in the body, especially they are found in abundant quantities in the RBCs, inside the RBCs. And some quantities are found, significant quantities are found in the liver. And so, hike in ALT and AST together produced liver disease. And if the blood is stored for a long time, stored for a long time, then of course, we cannot say there will be lysis of RBCs. And the hemoglobin will be released where this hemoglobin contains AST. And if you check the blood for AST, the AST will be high. Okay. So AST level increases in pneumonitis, lung trauma, lung fibrosis, metastatic lung diseases lung carcinoma and severe pulmonary consolidations. Then, we all know that the lung is the organ which is involved in oxygen transportation as well as carbon dioxide excretion. Gas excretion. Gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, etc. are expired or eliminated through the expired air. So, imagine if there is a chronic lung disease and this uh, elimination of blood gases such as ammonia is not taking properly what will be, what will do, what can be done or what will be the consequence. Of course, the kidney is there to a certain extent, the ammonia can be converted into uric acid and the uric acid can be detoxified to urea 
and then excrete it through the kidneys. That is good. But at the same time, a majority of the ammonia can be simply expired or eliminated through the expired air. But the lung is having a chronic idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or pulmonary consolidation. What can it? What will be the consequence? There will be excess accumulation of ammonia in the blood. Blood gases will accumulate. And what happens to this ammonia? The large quantity of ammonia which is accumulated cannot be converted to uric acid but can be slowly converted due to a hypoventilation because hypoventilation occurs due to a chronic pulmonary disease and so what will happen there will be hyperammonemia ammonia intoxication this can happen so the same thing can happen or otherwise Urea will be formed. Liver will be working hard to convert ammonia to uric acid and then to urea. So excess ammonia will be converted to urea and the urea accumulates. Urea accumulates. So what will happen? When you look the blood, the blood will be having hike in blood urea nitrogen so then my another question is see when there is a hike in bun generally what will we think there is a kidney dysfunction see what happened here is the kidney the culprit no here the lung is the culprit the hike in the npn occurred or azotemia occurred only due to a pulmonary dysfunction. Hatfield Pharma presents Pantohat, proton pump inhibitor systemic drug. A powerful tool to prevent and treat gastric ulcers and esophagitis. Pantohat IV injection. Pantoprazole 40 mg vial. Indications. To prevent and treat gastric ulcers and esophagitis. Dosage for dogs and cats 0.7 mg to 1 mg per kg over 15 minutes once daily. Root IV. Presentation 40 mg vial. Pantoprazole sodium tablets. Pantohat 40 tablets. Pantoprazole 40 mg Indications To prevent and treat gastric ulcers and esophagitis Dosage for dogs and cats 1 mg per kg per day Root Oral Presentation 1 into 10 tablets You can book your order online at www.hatwit.com Looking forward to a long-lasting business association. Thank you. Where the kidney cannot be blamed. The kidney is working normally. How can we say that the kidney is working normally? As we said, the more sensitive thing. I have go back to our classes of blood biochemistry. I have clearly mentioned that uh, creatinine is more, more sensitive than blood urea nitrogen as far as the kidney diseases are concerned or the renal filtration is concerned so creatinine is highly sensitive so creatinine is more significant but here creatinine is unaltered in lung disease but the bun is altered bun has a hike but ultimately what is happening the npn is high due to a chronic lung disease so we say that Lung is a second kidney. Lung is a second kidney. Why? Because this is the problem. So, for effective elimination of the end products of protein metabolism such as ammonia, 
the lung also should be functioning normally. Got it? Always think of it. Whenever you see that there is hike in blood urine nitrogen, you should not think of the you should not think of the kidney alone. You should have to think of the lung also. So lung is said to be the second kidney. Got it? Okay. So hyperammonemia, ammonia induced encephalopathy, etc. due to reduced exchange of ammonia, gas through pulmonary alveolar epithelium is chronic alveolar diseases also. There is chronic pneumonia. So just keep in mind that it is a chronic pulmonary disease can cause hyperammonemia and hike in NPN substances. That is why it is said that lung is said to be the second kidney. Got it? Lung is said to be the second kidney. Now, we will pass on to the last phase of our webinar. That is thoracosynthesis. It is very important because plural effusions are very commonly found in our clinics. Whenever there is a severe plural effusion, and there is severe inspiratory dyspnea. Severe inspiratory dyspnea. That is, there is restrictive dyspnea due to severe pleural effusion. Yesterday I told you there are three types of dyspnea. Inspiratory dyspnea, expiratory dyspnea and restrictive dyspnea. When there is a restrictive dyspnea, it cannot inspire too much due to the accumulated fluid inside the pleural cavity. So what is the treatment? It is nothing. Immediately aspirate as much as fluid from the pleural cavity. It is very easy. I am going to elaborate the technique, but it is very easy. We need a fenestrated catheter. These are the materials here clippers, 2 percent lidocaine, 60 ml syringe with the stopcock and IV extension set, number 11 BP blade, 3 ml empty syringe. 60 to 20 gauge catheter for cats, 14 to 16 gauge catheter for dogs, 18 gauge catheter in small or in small dogs. So, you no know, catheter means it should have a stylet inside, and the catheter it should be plastic, like our Venflon IV catheter. But at the same, against the IV catheter, this should have fenestrations. Or if it is not having fenestrations, we can make certain holes with a sharp blade. But the holes should be very small. Otherwise, it will bend off. So these are the things. So this is the catheter, 2cc syringe, the catheter with a stylet, BP blade, syringe, stopcock tube, Okay, all these things. See, in this photograph, actually, this plural effusion, plural, yesterday we told that, we studied that plural effusion in radiograph can be seen in the lower or the ventral areas near the sternum. Near the sternum. It is generally, it is seen on the ventral areas near the sternum. And Air can be aspirated from the upper areas. So, when you are going to aspirate the fluid, don't make it lie down on the lateral recumbency. Always do aspiration of pleural effusion. That is what I am doing also. Do in the live stage that always in the standing position. And always select the second or the third or the fourth in the costal space, just above the sternal border. So this is just a demonstration which is laterally lying. This is a cadaver. Uh, it's a dead animal. So you mark the area well. You put a mark there. Then instill lignocaine 
infiltration and then you slowly introduce the catheter while we are introducing the catheter it is so simple while we are introducing the catheter that means when we are penetrating the skin and the circuits and before just before we will feel that skin is it is penetrating the skin and the circuits and when it is penetrating the intercostal space immediately pull it and make some negative pressure inside the syringe so that further when it is advancing when it reaches the pleural space immediately the water inside the fluid inside the pleural space will gush into the syringe by that stop it don't then don't advance the needle this happens only in this much thickness in four or five millimeters it will happen so be very cautious while penetrating in four or five millimeters this fluid will be gushed out so you are introducing the needle stellate inside and the catheter which is on the attached to the needle so when it is entering the pleural cavity then don't push it again it will penetrate the lungs don't do it so while you are getting the fluid stop it and then with that intact you slowly release it slowly release the, release the stillet before releasing the stillet you tilt it and make it parallel to the surface of the body of the animal and then slowly release release it and then push the slowly slowly release it the stillet alone and then push the catheter slowly into the pleural space it will easily jump into easily get into because you do it once it is very easy it will easily go into and it can be fixed inside and when it is there you can fix the rubber tubing with the syringe and the stopcock and then you can aspirate it see it is now we are introducing this needle stillet the stillet is being introduced near to the see near to the rib it is a cadaver what we are doing here so these are all the procedures which i explained this is the stillet and the catheter through which we can make small holes small holes can be made by cutting small holes the holes should be very small tiny holes otherwise the catheter will bend when the stillet is not inside see here the technician is cutting small holes and before introducing what you should do is pick this pull the skin make a stab incision through the stab incision we should have to penetrate the catheter make a stab incision and through the stab incision we are see he is introducing the catheter just simply penetrating the skin only just you know by three or four millimeters it will reach the pleural cavity so it not we should not be too deep always while you are penetrating the skin immediately aspirate the fluid like this aspirate the fluid like this aspirate like this you can create a negative pressure here here also you can see the negative pressure the negative pressure is created here while see at the tip of the catheter should be held like this with the left hand and the left hand should be resting on the table definitely the left hand the one hand which you are holding the catheter should rest on the table then only you should do it so that means either in the standing for either animal should be in the standing position or in the sternal recumbency then only by gravity the fluid will come down then slowly you insert into the by penetrating into the skin and the circuits through the stab incision and when it is penetrating what happens immediately the this negative pressure was created when it is reaching the pleural cavity immediately fluid will be aspirated into the syringe 
Okay. Into the syringe. And with that, immediately stop it. Stop the procedure. Then we will have to slowly release the plunger. That is a stillet. Slowly release the stillet. And now he is, the technician is releasing the stillet. While you are releasing the stillet, it is a natural tendency that we will release both of it. Don't pull the catheter out. The catheter should be intact and pull out only the stillet. That you should be very, very much careful. See, this you should study. Each and every doctor should study because this is very commonly found. And you can tilt it. See, slowly tilt it. See, the technician is now tilting and making it parallel to the surface of the body. And then while it is being released out, then slowly pull it, pull it, pull it, pull it inside. See, push it inside and push it deep inside. It will be going parallel to the chest wall into the pleural cavity. Further, there is no stillet inside. It will not injure the pulmonary tissue. It will be going through the uh, pleural space only. So, by this procedure, then now it is, see these are the, this is the surface of the, this is the surface of the skin, this is the skin, and this is the cross section of the vertebra, sorry, the rib, and this is the intercostal muscle, this is the intercostal muscle, this is the intercostal muscle, you can see, your, this is a stillet, and this is the catheter with the fenestration, and now with the stillet, with the catheter, the stillet is introduced, this is the needle, sharp needle, it is introduced into, this is a pleural space, this is the parietal, this is the parietal pleura, this is a visceral pleura, this is a pleural space which contains fluid inside, and now when it reaches the, this area, immediately you can see water, the fluid will be aspirated through here into the syringe, and it, when it reaches inside, then further you should not proceed, you stop it here, if you further proceed, it will sometimes penetrate into. So, while you are introducing, see what they are doing. See this, see this, what we are doing. While the immediately the fluid is found, you slowly, one or two millimeters, you pull it back. So that it will get the sharp end of the needle will go inside the tube. And then advance the tube again forward slightly forward so that this tube cannot penetrate further penetrate because it is blunt it is a plastic tube itself it is blunt and now it is completely inside the pleural space then now what we are doing is we are tilting we are tilting it here we are tilting it here so that we can push it and we can put the catheter like this so it is completely inside see it is completely it is penetrating it now it is now this is a multi procedure by which a big hole is made and it is bent now we can tilt the catheter it can be fixed to the rubber tubing or the plastic tubing Fixed to the stopcock. Stopcock also we can buy it from any laboratories fitted to big syringe and then we try to aspirate. It may be the fluid, may be the air, whatever it be, you aspirate. You can fix the catheter to the skin like this. Sometimes if it is a very large hole produced, while you cut the hole, you should be very cautious not to cut a hole very large sometimes it becomes like this see this is a very large hole you should not put the hole like this. see this is very large and definitely this will bend and this can also happen when it is a large hole tending of the skin so these are the procedures when we are dealing with the thoracocentesis and thoracocentesis can be dealt with in animals 
when if it is a dog it needs all this procedure if it is a cat uh, pleurisy or pleural fluid accumulation in the cat is very common it produces severe restrictive dyspnea and in my practice i should say if at all you see a cat with severe respiratory distress such as a severe restrictive uh, inspiratory restrictive dyspnea if it uh, struggles too much for respiration almost 90% of the case if it is not asthma if it is an expiratory dyspnea if it is if it is a respiratory dyspnea expiratory dyspnea it could be asthma or if it is cough it is asthma if it is severe restrictive or inspiratory dyspnea you see that there is likely to be a chance of pleural effusion immediately what you should do simply take a scalpel set that will do simply take a scalpel set and and penetrate through the area of the just immediately above the sternal junction of the third or the fourth intercostal space so that it will reach the pleural space and then aspirate it uh pleural effusions are very common in cats so i will show you a video of uh, the pleural effusion in a cat aspiration of pleural effusion in a cat Is it taken from the internet? See, now he is locating with ultrasound. See the pleural effusion here. See, this is the pleural effusion. This is the pleural effusion. This is what he's the doctor is going to aspirate. See, this is a guided aspiration. See. So simply take the scalpel set. See, see it is being aspirated. So simple, sanguineous aspirate. See. See what happens after the aspiration. So that was you know, simply it was a aspiration of the cat. See in the cat, the, the thing is that immediately after aspiration of the pleural effusion, immediate relief will be there. That is a magical sense. Immediate relief will be there, especially in this cat. You see the immediate relief, and also if we have an ultrasound, you can continue with the ultrasound. Along with the aspiration, and you can feel the difference. And my dear friends, and so with this, my dear friends, I am concluding. And now we are going for discussions. Jai Hind, Bharat Mata ki Jai.